Antonio, it's great to have you here on Manufacturing Happy Hour, and uh, as we always do when these conversations get started, if we were meeting in person, having this conversation over a drink, where might that be? Paint the picture. For me, it probably would be in Bora Bora, as we just are relaxing uh, with our feet in the water with an Americano, so that would be, that would be me, my choice. I love it. We're recording this in the morning. You and I both have our coffee, so some Americanos in the morning in Bora Bora. So I, I want you to ask, answer this first question as if we're having that beverage with one another. How do you describe what the head of manufacturing, digital solutions, global supply chain does as if you're having Americanos with someone? So I probably would say that uh, providing digital solutions for uh, factory workers in the shop floor uh, in manufacturing to augment and amplify the operators in a way that would achieve um, to remove the cognitive data from their mind and eliminate waste, right? Uh, and for me, I, I think that it would be all the way through uh, the the global uh, supply chain, right? So um, that's going to be really strategic for us. And and I'm excited to talk about tried and true approaches to manufacturing, digital tools, supply chain. We're going to get into all these topics in today's conversation. But first, I have to ask you about your background. I want to get to know you a little bit, and and I'd love to hear a bit of a story from your, if you can tell us, you started your career in HR, and then you've told me before that you made the shift to widget manufacturing. So tell us, how do you decide to make that shift from HR into more of, let's say, the traditional operations of manufacturing world? Right. So um, when I when I went to school, like for my undergrad, um, you know, I, I learned how people make choices. My major was, was economics. And so uh, one of the pieces that I was missing uh, was the labor. And for an organization, material and labor are the most expensive thing. So for me, I, I thought I'd like to understand the labor side a little bit more. So I got a master's in human resource development. And so, you know, into the HR role, you know, somewhat in the back of your mind, you're always curious and intrigued about widget making. And so uh, I soon as getting the opportunity of having a strong understanding from an HR standpoint, uh, I transitioned into uh, making widgets and really, really excited and happy to be in that space and absolutely love it. I mean, manufacturing is, is great, you know, and so it's really how our world is, is, is built and will change over time. So it's very intriguing for me and very interesting. What was the most, this is a two-part question, what was the most exciting part of making that change, being more involved with the manufacturing itself? What was the most challenging part of that as well? So you can answer that um, in whichever order you want. Well, I think for me, um, it's just really changing the way I, I thought, right? Because I, I started from scratch. I started from ground zero. So I had to be a sponge and, and truly understand and comprehend how manufacturing works. I think that a lot of people on the outside have an opinion, but until you're there in the mix, it's, it's, it's very difficult to comprehend all the nuances that happen on the manufacturing floor and all the things that impact it. So it's just like uh, we see it from a customer standpoint, you know, because we go and we buy uh, what we want, but how did it get there? That transition of all of that work to get that item on the shelf, that part is um, was really like something where you just had to continue to learn. And, you know, I've um, had to work with a lot of engineers and I'm not, an engineer by major, and uh, that uh, transition right there was uh, exciting. I, I worked with 
I mean, some exceptional engineers to help get me on point where in a room people did not know that I was not an engineer, right? So, um, but I, I have to give that to uh, a lot of the people that I worked with, so. So that just made me think of another question, right? If you're getting exposed to and working to a lot of di a lot of different engineers for the first time, what are some of the strengths that you feel your HR background brought to those scenarios? I think that it's uh, dealing with people, right? Um, like you you learn that uh, some people do not have like a high emotional intelligence, and so I think that. Um, I had to work on that myself and, and read up on it. Uh, and because when you think in a logical way, you know, it, it, it removes a lot of noise, right? You know, you're not thinking of uh, anything personal. It works or it do not work, sort of speak. You can do this and you cannot do this. And it's pretty um, cut, cut and dry and clear. And then understanding that there is a gray area, right? And so just comprehending that all, that's where that HR, I mean, uh, you're just dealing with all type of um, personality types. And that's not only um, from, you know, just the engineers, you're dealing with people, you know, in quality, you're dealing with people in finance, you're dealing with uh, shop floor workers. Some of them uh, maybe have a little bit of college. Some of them, you know, don't even have a high school diploma, you know, all people's of walks of life. And so being able to understand and listen to all of them, I think is, uh, have been advantageous for me, not only uh, in my career, but even in the leadership style that I, uh, I, I try to implement for uh, the people that's underneath me and the peers and teammates that I, I work with. Yeah, I'm, I'm an engineer by degree myself. I haven't been in an engineering role for a very long time, but yes, it's, it's very uh, black and white. It works or it doesn't, and I like that you're able to fill in a lot of those gray areas with your background, so to speak, that emotional intelligence piece you bring up and appreciating that you know, everyone's experiences and backgrounds are going to play to how they manage certain situations, and it sounds like you could have been a bit of the glue to help everyone work around that. A little bit in those situations mm -hmm. so uh, another question because i'm looking at your your some of your earlier roles you i think your first role was a lean champion with black and decker that was mm -hmm. one of your first major soirees into the operations side the manufacturing side and i'm excited to talk to you about you know let's say lean manufacturing in this interview but in, in manufacturing happy hour fashion, let's set a little baseline first. You know, let's say we're having those Americanos in Bora Bora. How do you describe what a lean champion does? What's what's the easiest way to break it down for those that might be earlier in their career just getting familiar with some of this? Right. So the, really at, at the base of it, there's a philosophy or it's it's not even a philosophy I, I think that it's more of a business practice of lean right so understanding what lean is it's like a way to continuously improve and I'm, I'm gonna just be straight up you know and let the elephant in the room you do this in order to uh, cut costs right like you're trying to simplify processes and ultimately uh, decrease the lead time and um, improve the throughput of your of your widgets making. So, so that's that's lean. And so, for me in that role, and for others that would have that role, they're walking the floor to find anything that they can in order to achieve that. And you know, there's there's more of a step process to do it, where it's like I'm going to take a look at this process. I'm going to record all the steps that this process, you know, like it's just like a, 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 a very scientific approach to reduce uh, waste um, or eliminate waste rather and um, reduce cost at, at, at all costs, so to speak. So uh, that's what I would say really a, a lean champion uh, really explored to do. Well, I love that because that's one of the simplest ways I've heard it described before, a scientific way of reducing waste, reducing costs. So 
I appreciate all the background you've given us here because I'm excited to dive into, let's say, some of your opinions around manufacturing. And this is something when you and I were talking <laughs> on the phone yesterday, I, I knew this was going to be a fun part of the conversation. But we live in a world of digital transformation, industry 4.0. What I, before we get there, I'd love to ask you, you know, when it comes to manufacturing, even with digitization, what are some of the tried and true approaches in manufacturing that you believe in that you feel are, let's say, baseline, things that everyone should be doing? Yeah, I think that understand your process. I think that that is extremely key. Uh, I think that you cannot get away with that. And I think when you think of industry 4.0 and technology, you're thinking that because we're going to make it digital, everything is going to go away, right? Like it's going to solve all our problems, you know, like it's technology, it's computer. And that's not the case. We still have to understand the process and begin to eliminate some of those items still with some of the scientific methods that, you know, that's normally practice and lean. And there's no way around that. Like those things will never go away. We can improve on the manner in which we approach them. But complete elimination, it's, it's just not going to happen. And it, it, you could see it in your life, right? Like when you got up this morning and you did all the activities, there's probably a way if it was recorded to go back through and um, probably smooth that out a little bit better and get you started up a, a, a lot quicker than you anticipated. And little things that you didn't even know that you did, you know, if you're there and you're under, understanding exactly what's going on, you can make it better and improve it. And so that's the, that's the thing that I think that a lot of people believe that they can just go in and make the improvements needed without fully comprehending what's going on. And I'm just saying, you know, from a, you know, from an overview, you don't have to know all the intricate details at the same rate. You do need to take the time to try to um, understand that process. So that, that's, that's what I would say. Sometimes we, uh, and I, I don't want to say we, because it's, it's never I, <laughs> I'm always going to try to understand just because of my background. But I, I think that a lot of people believe that from an industry 4.0, we have this data and we can't be wrong, right? You know, you create, like, even if you think of advanced analytics, you create an algorithm and you have it targeting a certain way. It can be wrong, right? Like, you, you truly have to know exactly what you're doing when uh, facing any process. So. That would be my thought and answer. A little long-winded there, but that would be my response to that question. Well, one of my big takeaways from that was you led that answer with process. You closed that answer with process. And we th this is a theme on the show quite a bit, right? When we talk digital transformation, industry 4.0, we're talking people, processes, and technology. And technology ends up being the tool at the end, as our, our mutual friend Jeff Winters has described in, in past episodes as well. Um, and then everything else, um, you know, goes before that, let's say, um, like you kind of described. And maybe I'd love to ask you this, you know, you're at Stanley Black & Decker. How, you know, can you describe how industry 4.0 impacts the way you do things there, how you've seen it play out maybe from your experience before? Yeah, I think that um, for us within the organization, we we see like, and it's just man, I, I'm I could name woo, so many things, um, and it's more so getting certain insights. I think that complexity within any organization is there and it exists, and being able to have the data to look at. Like it, it just it it it's like, you know, aha, <laughs> you know, everyone mm -hmm. has that aha moment when they're able mm -hmm. to see that data. And that's what industry 4.0, that's what it gives you. It gives you uh, just an enormous amount of, of data that you were unaware of. And one of the places like, for instance, on the shop floor, 
that's where there's a lot of hidden data because you have this operator, some of the things that they do, you know, you, you don't really know that they're doing it, right? You know, they just do that action and, you know, it's not recorded anywhere. It's not on a router. It's not. And so when you can have a way in order to capture that digitally and hopefully, you know, automatically, you know, automate that as much as possible. And then you're able to share that, and, you know, to someone else and say, hey, what do you think about those numbers, right? What, what do you think about this? And it obviously accentuates an opportunity that everyone can jump on, right? And that's the, and that's all functions, right? But it's I'm when I when I think about uh, and I, maybe that's just from uh, my view and the role that I play. I'm thinking of all functions. I'm not just focusing on the process engineer. I'm thinking about the product engineer, the data they could say, you know what, that's really, really challenging to manufacture. Maybe we should go down a couple of thousands, right, on the on the drawing uh, in order for that throughput to be increased, right, at, at that particular process. So, I mean, it, it's uh, not to get uh, technical, but those are the type of thoughts that happen in the space and what Industry 4.0 can do. It can enhance your operation in a way uh, that allows you to take advantage of really, really great opportunities that were not as easily visible from regular operation. So, I'd love to give a tip to the audience here a little bit based on your experience because you've talked about mm -hmm. you got to have your processes in place. You talk about there being hidden data on the plant floor. Can you reflect on your experience to think about some of the foundational things you needed to do first? within your manufacturing operation to make sure you were ready to start leveraging Industry 4.0? Because what I want to make sure our audience avoids is just slapping technology and collecting data for data's sake, but making sure they're doing the right fundamental things first to make sure that the activities they're doing as part of their digital transformation are worthwhile and the right activities. Right, yeah. I, I think that it all starts with lean, not to be biased here. I think that the having a great lean site that uh, embrace that type of culture uh, is the it's the it's the foundation of uh, any digital solution industry 4.0 anything even if you were to look at you know additive manufacturing as a pillar it still starts there you you have to have this culture of lean and that methodical approach about the way that you do things. And then I think that if I were to put out the warning, it, it, it goes with the question that, the way that I answered the question as far as understanding how all the pieces go together. And that, that comes with having dialogue with the rest of the functions. I'm, I'm sure like, um, I, could use many, many examples as, you know, that's what my career has allowed me uh, of, of being able to touch so many things in the manufacturing floor and like in different places, right? Different cities, different countries. It just it, it opens your mind up to uh, what can be. And you you see it one way at one place and then you see it at another place and it could be slightly different. And then you, you, you're able to capture that and take that with you and say, hey, you know, I saw it this way, you know, over here. You know, why don't you try this? Right. And sharing that. Well, with Industry 4.0, you can connect those easy. We can see several different ways of doing things simultaneously, so to speak. Right. And so mm -hmm. and then compare the data and, and really prove out what that best method is and share that. That's that's the aim that people get, but where they lose is taking the time to truly understand what the end game is, right? And I, I think that at the bottom line, we're trying to improve and then also um, reduce, uh, improve productivity, reduce cost if it's possible, right? And I, I think that it's always possible if you're doing the proper thing. So uh, I think that that would be key and then obviously the other things of, you know, uh, understanding your facility, you know, understanding uh, all the way down to the square feet, you know, 
and the coverage within that facility if you have Wi-Fi in that facility and um, coming with governance, right? I think that, you know, you have to mention governance. I think that before you even introduce uh, a digital solutions within your uh, organization, start talking about the governance at the very beginning. Uh, just have that laid out so you have those rules and laws in place so you know once you begin you've already uh, prepared and did some of the prep work in order to be successful uh, down the road so governance a foundation in lean we talk about being results oriented keeping an eye on the end game great little pragmatic checklist there for the folks listening I want to put another spin on this as well, because in addition to you being a lean champion, I feel like you're also a champion of the operator, a champion of the people out on the plant floor. And and when you talked about this with me yesterday, you were describing that, hey, at the end of the day, every, everything kind of stops with them. We need to keep those people front and center of these ideas. So can you go into that a little bit more? Can you tell us why that's so important to keep an operator centric mindset in all of this? Right. Yeah, I can. And thank you for asking that question. I'd love to answer that um, because I believe that everyone needs to have this uh, in the back of their mind. Every single organization that manufactures, every one of them, you can go all the way to the top of the food chain. Um, it only matters at the operator level, the person that makes the widget. That's it. Everyone else that's making those decisions or whatever, they're not as important as the person making the widget. And me, and I, I guess that has a lot to do with where I come from, I had to work with a lot of operators. You know, that was like, you know, first coming in, I'm hearing them speak. And you hear their woes. You hear, you know, uh, you know, uh, if you got some very uh, uh, tenured equipment <laughs> uh, that's uh, probably from like the Civil War. Um, so, like some of that old pieces of equipment, you know, they they have to do certain things. And listening to them and making their lives better and improving their lives in order to make that widget should be the top priority of every single organization because they're the ones that matter. They make the widget that you sell. They actually create it, right? It's their hands that touch it. They are truly the makers, right? And so uh, that's the reason why for me, they're, they're front and center. They're the most important part of the organization um, in, in my eyes. I, I'm not trying to belittle anyone else's function. I just think that they do play a very key, um, a, a key part in it. Well, I look at the people on the plant floor, the operators there. I mean, you got to have a strong foundation, right? For everything else to work, you need to make sure those pieces are in play. So, no, I, I, I love how you brought the human aspect of this uh, into our conversation so much today. One last question on, on this part around our digital transformation type of conversation. What do you feel is something a lot of operation leaders or manufacturing leaders in general miss when it comes to creating a digital transformation plan? I think you've hinted at some of this in this conversation, but maybe a way to put a bow around this so that way our audience avoids any pitfalls when they go through this. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think it's looking at the big picture. I think that a lot of times people get laser focused on what they're on and not necessarily taking the holistic approach. And when um, associating that digital solution and it's fine, it's like, OK, cool, we're going to get information for this one machine and we're going to get this one machine operational. Right. And we're going to have all of this stuff going. And that's only one part of the process, right? And so where the opportunity is, is take a step back and say, okay, when I get this um, information, what am I going to do with it? Because it's only reporting data, but action is still important. You know, I could give you, you know, um, OEE and, and TEEP and every single acronym, every single KPI that you could imagine. 
the key is, is that, okay, now you know what your KPI is. Now what? Right? Like, it's just like, okay, cool. You know, we, we figured out all of these items. Now what do we do? And I think that's where, that's where the opportunity is, is um, creating a way to, like, for us, I'll, I'll just speak in my role, role. I try to give information where it's actionable. So I'm displaying it in a way where it's actionable. When you see it, you want to do something about it, right? The thing is, is that, and, and this is the next level is, it's okay, the action happens in a, in a, in a digital way or... I don't want to necessarily say in a digital way, but what you can say is, is it is a closed loop and without going full, you know, like AI, you see what I'm saying? Because ultimately that's where we'll, he that's where we'll head. But if you can get as close as you can to that point, I think that that's where, that's where the opportunity is, is, is thinking about, okay, first it's like, okay, this is, you know, this is only what, like if you're making orange juice, I'm just gonna make it simple, right? So our, our, our point is to have this juice. And so you start with the orange, do you peel the orange or whatever? And so, but it's gotta go in the cup. So we'll be so focused on squeezing the orange and not taking the consideration of going into the cup and what's gonna make that easy. And the translation of all of that juice to the cup, all of that matters, you know, how you transport that sort of thing. And so you have to be thinking of all of it. You just can't be thinking of one because if you do not, then you will have a lot of rework in your process because now you have to go back and you're like, well, we were only focused on this, you know, so we let's do this over again so we can think of all of it or, or set it up for this next process. And if you're thinking about that uh, up front, then you can avoid all of that waste, right? Like you're creating waste. I'm, I'm going to say that a lot here in this. Uh, no, <laughs> it, it, it's a it's a great <laughs> example, right? Like digital transformations, just like making orange juice, right? There's a big picture perspective. There's a lot that goes into it that you need to be thinking about. I'm going to borrow that analogy in the future as well. That's probably going to be something I'm going to pull out of my digital transformation toolbox for years to come so um <laughs> this is we man we could talk about digital transformation all day long i have to ask you about supply chain as well because that's another big part of your your role you know how how has supply chain shaped your global perspective right and then maybe we get into the bits and bytes of this a bit more we'll we'll start there wow so um i i think that this is the the real full holistic view, right? So you can think of a view from the manufacturing facility, what they would call, you know, like a, a value stream. Uh, and so, you know, within a manufacturing facility, you have a value stream and several value streams throughout it, right? And so a lot of, uh, especially lean practitioners that, you know, get into the space, their value streaming map, their manufacturing facility, now, when you when you're like someone like me and I have to do it all in my mind, like you learn the stuff like you can do it very quickly of a value stream map for the supply chain, right, all the way through. So now you're not only thinking of the manufacturing facility, you're thinking about the material. Where is it coming from? And then where does that material come from? Like it. it, it it, it never ends. And then so you're you're looking upstream and you're looking downstream and you have that approach. And so now it's the same thing that I was saying uh, previously about making sure that we cover uh, all the aspects and think about that next process. Well, that's what we have to do as well in the supply chain is to make sure that it, at least from a digital solution standpoint, that we're touching every single place downstream and up mm. to ensure that our lead time is being conquered and that we have the data to be able to tag. And, and that's, that's the, that's the uh, main objective of 
every single organization is to simplify that process in a way so you can be able to make decisions on it. Like, I mean, every organization is just not Stanley Black and Decker. If they're not doing that, then um, that's an interesting approach to not control all of it. And then e even when you think about it from a lean standpoint, there's a there's an item called uh, and uh, the people in this uh, podcast probably will uh, smile if they're if they're if they embrace lean. It's a PFEP plan for every part. So you have to have a plan for every part, but it's way deeper. Like you, you have your, you know, it's just like going to school. You got your, your bachelor level, you can get a master's degree. Well, I got to think at a PhD level, right? Like that's what I would say when your supply chain, it's PhD level time, you know, because mm. every single cent matters, you know, and I, I you know, being, I, I think in, in like curves, right? We're, we're always trying to uh, improve the marginal cost and reduce, you know, cost all that we can, right, to improve our business. We want our business to be the best. So that's very, very important. And so if you look at all of it, then you can obviously identify some opportunities that maybe wasn't as visible, right, with the looking at it. But if once you attack and you begin to understand and you begin collecting the data, you may see in math form, you know, and it's it's very uh, something just happened here just last week. Um, uh, like uh, with our team, you know, you see the numbers and it's like, whoa, now that is fascinating. You know, there is an opportunity to improve there where in a place where you wouldn't. You wouldn't you at least expect an opportunity like that. And it's just like it's like the Warren Buffett compounding effect. It just it keeps it keeps compounding, right? So you're thinking small, but you know, you know, many wins, you know, M I N I, you know, sets you up to have many wins, right? M A N Y. Yeah. And with that thinking, it just builds, right? You know, it's the snow snowball effect and when you can build that type of culture especially with digital um obviously you're going to be able to improve um no matter where you no matter what organization it is not only stanley black and decker i'm saying any with that type of culture and mentality and so a lot of times that's the supply chain method is that you have to look at all of it and when i say all of it i'm not even ending a lot of people think that we end at the customer we do not right like the customer we need a review we need that information too that information needs to be digital like we're trying to conquer it all like as much as we possibly can so it's um it's it's a very fascinating and, and pretty fun job so well i'm glad we saved supply chain for the end because you know planning for every part you tied in a lot of the things we talked about earlier in the conversation right because when you mentioned you know having let's say visibility to where you're getting your parts from right that's the digital thread that's digital transformation in my mind beyond the four walls of the factory and digital transformation with your supply chain as well huge advice um I, I love all this this has been basically a master class in lean and digital transformation and supply chain today uh, what obviously the past two years we're recording this mid late 2022 the last two years in supply chain have been a challenge um what advice would you recommend to those that have supply chain responsibility to keep heads above water and be thinking about how are the ways we can continue to revolutionize our supply chain for the long run, kind of like you described, by having that data, be able to keep that bigger picture perspective. What advice would you have for those listeners? Well, so I would say first that it was the perfect storm. Like it's very difficult and challenging um, to foresee some of the economic um, opportunities that happened here, right? Like, I mean, it was like, this is, it's, it's really new territory, but it's just like, like I said, the perfect storm, right? It, it really is. So many things happened, you know, I mean, I mean, just, I mean, COVID, 
you know, a one word can say, you know, how do you prepare for a pandemic? Like, you know, and so then that pandemic happens and then we're, we're trying to recover, uh, uh, like here in the States from it, but in the world from that. And then we see supply chain disruption, right? And then, you know, uh, we're reacting to that and thinking and trying to be very uh, intelligent about our choices then for, you know, like things that happen after. So for me, I think that this really is an opportunity to say this was the perfect storm. We realized that. How would we prevent this in the future? Right. And 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 that, that's where you're going to need. It's kind of like we're, we're cleaning it all up. How would you prevent this in the future? And what are those those indicators uh, that we need to to ping off to say, hey, put our eyes on this. This could be concern, right? This could be alarming um, in, in in the future. And I think that that is the philosophy and idea uh, that's happening um, uh, with everyone. I, at least I hope from a, from a digital standpoint, as far as saying, hey, we really couldn't avoid uh, a, a lot of this, right? Because uh, you, you, I mean, I, I, I could name so many things that uh, I struggle to get, you know, in my personal life. So, you know, everyone's going through it. And at the same rate, it's like, okay, but for us, what um, actions can be completed in order to achieve um where if this were to happen again, we can avoid it. And I think that everyone knows, right? Like, and if they don't, that's where their study should go. And I think that from a, a um, more of a complete control of some of that data is, is, what, is what's going to have to take place as far as you're, you're looking at certain uh, data, you know, even, you know, you could look at past history from there, but it wouldn't help you in certain circumstances. But having uh, your hand on, on on the pulse of what's going on all the time and then going around and having the check of that data. And, and I'll give you an analogy to kind of bring home what I'm trying to say. You have some individuals that uh, go and get um, blood work completed every three months. Right. So four times a year, they're going to get their blood, their blood work um, completed. Why are they doing that? Right. They're doing that in order to ensure that they see if there's something wrong, we can take action. This same analogy here is the idea that I'm thinking now we we're forced in order to make sure that we have complete control. We're forced to have that blood work completed every three months because we can't predict the future. We don't know if if pandemic 2.0 is coming. We, we have no clue. No one can predict the future, you know. So in order for us not to go and try to hire Nostradamus, let's go ahead and create processes where we're getting the right information in order to make the best decision for our organization. And so that would be my advice to all. I love it. It's been incredible learning from your experience today, tying in processes, lean, great, you know, best practices that have been in manufacturing for a long time, mixing that in with digital, tying it into the importance of supply chain. This has been one of the most comprehensive overviews we've got on this topic. Thank you so much for bringing this to the show. You know, let's go back to Bora Bora for a second. I, I feel like our, uh, um, our our Americanos are getting uh, they're getting empty, so we're probably going to need a refill soon. But final question as we take our final sips. Um, I have to ask you, you know, people think of Stanley Black & Decker, power tools, all of that. that. I mean, it's one of the most iconic brands out there. Um, just a fun question. What's one of the coolest parts about working at Stanley Black & Decker? Well, um, this is you're going to think this is a bias statement, right? You know, about conversation. I would say it's the people, right? I really would. I would say it's the people like our, we have phenomenal product engineers, let me say, you know, and like really, really awesome. Um, but I would have to say that it's, it's, it's some, we have 
very, very awesome people that work there with um, – that bring a, a lot of, and, and I, I guess because I'm global, I, you know, I'm talking to people all over the world, right? So, you know, and it's just, it's it's really amazing. So that would be my, the people would be my number one. Uh, number two would be the um, diversity of products, right? So that to me is, I mean, we got all type of products. So it's, it's, it's really cool to uh, see like those products made, um, it's it's a really really awesome thing. And then obviously to purchase some of those products, like we yeah. definitely are, are big on quality. So you know that you're getting a great quality product when it comes from us. So uh, that's the that's the thing for me. That's really I'm I'm trying to think is there something else that I'm missing bes- besides those two? Um, hmm. I mean because. I, you know, there's certain things that we do, um, uh, and like from a leadership standpoint, uh, it's just a lot of transparency and, and, you know, just, I, I don't know, it's just different. So the people part is probably, I would have to say tip top, right? Like, I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's very a different approach when, you know, you know, you shared news and the most bare way and you know and then you can just say oh you know i don't really understand that and then you know get someone to explain you know what's going on and so um yeah uh but the people are are really great you know and i uh, there's yeah. some I, i'm sitting here thinking about all the people that i've encountered within the organization and they're really really a lot of awesome people that work there so i, I would have to say the people I love it. Well, from people to the product engineers, the great product. I've I literally have some Stanley Black and Decker in my literal tool belt, so um, it's you know <laughs> certainly a brand that's easy to visualize. And I think when I was looking it up, you have an insane number of manufacturing facilities. Like it is no shortage of the places that is it upwards of fifty in the U.S. alone? Am I making that up? I thought I saw that somewhere when I was researching. More than that. Um... Oh wow! I don't know. I can't. Um, yeah, we we got quite a bit, right? We got quite a bit. I don't, you know, I don't want to get. Yeah, it's a lot, right? So yeah, you know, um, yeah. I mean, we we have a lot, man, and I'm glad to hear that you have that uh, our products in your in your tool belt. You know, that's really important. You know, and hopefully they're just like I said, uh, they're quality items, and uh, so that's really really cool. That that made me excited. You know. Um, well, maybe this is the right way to end this interview then. If you're looking for the audience out there, if you're looking for someone to take advice on lean manufacturing, digital transformation, supply chain, take it from someone like Antonio that has more than 50 manufacturing facilities and just that the number's too big to count. So take the advice from someone that's managing a very large enterprise. So, hey, I, I appreciate you for sticking around for so long today, Antonio. This has been a great conversation. Thanks for sharing so much wisdom. For everyone out there, if you want to access anything we talked about, show notes page at manufacturinghappyhour.com. You can connect with Antonio there. And with that, Antonio, thanks so much for jumping on today's show. Thanks for having me.